So today I'm joined by Jonathan Pajot. Um, a lot of people, say hello Jonathan, so we can see your face. Hello everybody. Great. I guess a lot of people watching this will know who you are already. Um, you, you've done quite a few public events with Jordan Peterson already. Um, and yeah, you actually reached out to me to, to talk about the value of organized religion. Uh, and it's something I, I don't have any sort of firm views on, so it'd be a really interesting subject to explore. Um, but I'd love to, to start by talking about the, the recent Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson debates, because I know you've been quite vocal about your view of, of, of how those have gone and, and whether they've actually achieved anything. And given that they're sort of fairly recent, I think that would be a good place to start and then move on to kind of our personal histories with Christianity, the value of organized religion, and then sort of maybe unpacking a few of these questions around the kind of ambivalence of Jordan Peterson's um, reawakening or, or re-understanding of some of the Christian tradition, and then that relation to the organized church and, and whether, yeah, that I, I, I sort of sense some tensions there that I'm, fun, I'm kind of uh, interested to explore. Yeah, yeah. I, first of all, thanks for, for uh, agreeing to talk with me. I've been kind of following the videos on, on and off. Uh, you know, I, I saw the first video. I remember when I saw your first video, your first interview with, with Jordan. And then I kind of, I kind of had a little negative reaction to your, uh, to your, to your video. But then I've, I've been following the, uh, your discussion, and uh, I saw the video with Paul, and I've been seeing kind of your interpretation of things, and I felt like you, uh, you really do have a, this kind of desire to enter into the discussion and to, to figure out what's happening. Maybe like just what is going on, because obviously something is happening. And there aren't that many people trying to uh, to figure out what the the size of this thing that's happening and kind of what the, the ramifications. And so I really appreciated your uh, your desire to kind of take it on and engage. And so I thought oh, it would be great to to have an, a direct discussion with you. So thanks for having me. No, um, thank you. Just I, I remember what that was. It was the Gnosticism line. Yeah, exactly. The film. <laughs> that, um, we'd lo I'd love to explore. My my friend and colleague Ali is a, is an expert on Gnosticism or researched it quite a lot for a free book. So I won't call him an expert, but he, he's yeah. a novelist and researched it quite a lot. So he'd love to have a conversation with you at some point about Gnosticism. So I know yeah, sure. I would love, I would love to, to do that too. Like I, I think uh, for sure it, it is, it is for sure. I do have a Christian perspective on Gnosticism and sometimes the, let's say the Christian perspective on Gnosticism is polemical. That's for sure. Uh, and so, so I kind of understand that. And so I would be happy to, uh, to talk with somebody who studied it more and, and, uh, and, and kind of duke it out and have that discussion. It'd be great to do that. Great. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. I, you've said a few really exciting things there that I want to just question. I mean, you, you talked about this thing that's happening and I think there's a lot of, I mean, what I sense on a sort of broad scale is there is a kind of intellectual awakening facilitated by the internet and the kind of the new media, the ability to go down as many rabbit holes as we want. Yeah. Um, but how would you summarize it? I think so. I think it's, I think what's going on, I think there's also something that's going on. It's that we've kind of reached the end of a certain cycle or we reach the end of a certain uh, time uh, where we kind of moved into a, uh, a kind of uh, nihilism, you know, in terms of everybody, all they wanted was to, you know, to, to have the, the nice car and to have, you know, a kind of superficial superficiality. And we saw that in, in the news and in the way that we've been fed media for the past, you know, 10, 20 years where, you know, we've been told how our attention span is shrinking and, you know, we need to have these 10 minute bits and then uh, advertisements. And, and so we can see it on TV still, like it still has that model where they, they have these little short tidbits of things that they present you and then they kind of move from one thing to the next. And I think that what we're seeing is, is we've just reached the end of that, because that's just not true that that's what human beings are. We're just not, we're not like that. And so it's actually pushing us in a direct, you know, it can, it's like, you could say something like, everybody likes to eat chocolate cake, and if you give someone chocolate cake, like they'll love it, obviously, and they'll want to have more. But if you eat chocolate cake for two days, at some point, you just get totally saturated and you want to have some veggies. And I think that's where we are, is that they've, the, 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 the media companies thought that they could just give us this candy forever. But at some point, people just got completely fed up. And now they want, they're looking for something a bit deeper and a bit more 
uh, intense and they're not getting it from the university. It's for anybody who studied in university. Uh, it's so ideological, especially in the humanities. It's so ideological. There's so little room for actual engagement and actual discussion, actual uh, plunging into the text of, a, of, a, of Western history um, that people are looking for it on the internet. And luckily we have some interesting people that are kind of coming up, I think. And I think that Jordan Peterson has been someone who has kind of filled, up, filled that uh, place. But there are some people that don't have the big, as much following as Jordan, but you'll find philosophers online that have, you know, 50,000 followers and their, view, their, their, uh, their lectures have, you know, 50,000 views on uh, this like ob obtuse uh, concept in Heidegger or like, you know, reading Hegel and it's like they have 50,000 views, which is just insane. It means that people are really hungry for something more than just the, just the Kardashians, you know? Mm. Yeah. 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 And do you, do you tie the, the Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson debate in any way to that sort of um, the, the changing of worldviews or the changing of different perspectives? Because, I mean, Harris is obviously the sort of the foremost advocate for a, the materialist paradigm, which I, I, I at least would sort of say is partly what has led to um, the kind of the sense of a lack of um, felt meaning in mm. people's lives. Yeah. I mean, well, there's a great line. Sorry, I'll just, there's a great line that a friend of mine um, came up with recently, which was, he said, scientism is worse than jihadism because jihadism doesn't create nuclear weapons. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, there is a kind of, I think that it's interesting to see it kind of from the outside is to see in, in a lot of the, uh, this kind of new atheist uh, bunch, a kind of blindness and a, and a kind of certainty, which you actually do discover in, uh, in Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, you know, like this kind of absolute certainty of what they're doing. And uh, also a pros like a, like a proselytizing where they just kind of want to convince you of their, of their thing. Um, and so it's really funny to, it's funny to kind of, it's funny to see that, but it is kind of frightening to think, like you said, that behind behind Jehovah's Witnesses, all you have are really annoying conversations at the door, but behind, behind scientism, you have artificial intelligence, you have uh, all these things like the, the, uh, the transhumanists, for example. I mean, they're, it's frightening how they're not, they don't have wisdom to, to kind of understand the, the propositions that they're making, this idea of putting, you know, uh, let's say electronic devices in the brain to increase people's thinking. And Sam Harris is for, actually is for some of that stuff. And, and so it's like they, they don't seem to understand the basic, the basic wisdom of humanity that how that would be problematic. They don't seem to be able to see what that is. Um, but I think it's interesting. It's been really interesting. At first, you know, when Jordan was trying to, to kind of engage with Sam Harris, I didn't totally understand why he was, he was so adamant about doing so because Jordan really did want to have this discussion with him. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually at Jordan's house uh, at the second discussion that, that Jordan had with Sam Harris. Uh, you know, the, the first one was the horrible one, the two hour like train wreck. The second one wasn't so bad. And I was actually at his house and we, we went over like the first Sam Harris debate with his son and, and Jordan, we watched, we like, we like listened to the whole thing. Then we kind of analyzed it. Where did it go wrong and everything. So Jordan was really, is really adamant about Sam. And uh, I kept wondering why him, like why him? And I think I know what it is. I think, I think because there is something in Sam Harris which represents a beginning of a transition. It's there in him because of all the new atheist types, he, he has had spiritual experiences uh, and he can't discount them. Like he can't pretend like those are meaningless. He knows how meaningful they are. And, and because of that, he, he does have a desire to recover something of spiritual tradition. It's just that he still has, like it's like he's kind of has a one foot in two worlds and he's trying to figure it out. It's as if Jordan also has his foot in two worlds, right? Jordan isn't totally on the religious side or on the scientific side. It's just that, so they both have their foot in two worlds. It's just that maybe one is pulling more on one side and the other is kind of pulling more on the other. One is saying there is value, there's more value than you think in the religious aspect. And the other is saying there's very little value in the religious thing. The only thing that's, that's worthy is the discussions about consciousness and, and uh, you know, especially Eastern or mystical uh, experiences. Like that's all that matters. Um, and so I think that that's why, I think that that's why the discussion has been so engaging for people. People have been so wanting to 
to follow it because I think people are trying to figure that out. They're trying to, to understand how, because every, I think most people do have an intuitive sense that there's more. Like there's an intuitive sense that there's something about our being in the world which has meaning, which is, and you have to actually work really hard to, to destroy that, to just be a, and most people who do that, they, they actually are, are deluding themselves because they say that they're just monkeys, you know, and they're, they're just a bunch of monkeys who are saying things. But, but if, you, if you pay attention just a little while to what they're saying, you realize that it's not true. They have hierarchies of values. They have, they have spirits to which they pray. They don't even know that they're praying to, to certain uh, gods, but they're, they're at the altar of certain gods and they're, 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 they're sometimes being possessed by those spirits, you know? Um, and so, so, anyway, so that's why I think it's been so interesting for people to, uh, to follow this because I think that's the discussion that people want to hear now because we, it's like we have, we're, we're in a moment where we have a loss of meaning. We, everybody's experiencing it. Like there's a, there's a kind of chaos of meaning, a chaos of identity, uh, a sense that things are crumbling or, or things, or we're not connected anymore together. We live in our little suburban homes. We don't know our neighbors. We don't have community. We don't, so, so all of that is, is real. And people are looking for solutions to that. And the discussion between Jordan and Sam is taking people just like one little step at a time towards figuring out what that means, even in terms of translating it in, in a way that people who are kind of scientifically minded could understand. Mm. Yeah, I, do you have a sense of, because I guess both of us share a sense that we think Peterson has a bigger perspective on this than Sam Harris. Um, and how do you sense that those debates have gone? I mean, and do you have a sense of what would need to shift for Sam to appreciate, for example, the fact that values have to be, have to be uh, rooted in a story, for example? I'd say the fundamental disagreements between them must are, are pretty much that, aren't they? That values have to be, they can't be derived rationally and they have to actually be um, more deep rooted than that. Yeah. I think that it's funny because at the end of the London discussion, uh, it's Sam who started to talk about consciousness. It's like towards the end of the discussion. And I felt like, ah, this is the place. This is the spot where the discussion, the next step of the discussion needs to happen. Um, the thing is that Jordan, Jordan is, Jordan doesn't, hasn't studied a lot, let's say, in terms of, of, of Eastern tradition, in terms of, of, in terms of uh, Buddhism. And also, even in terms of Christianity, he hasn't studied the mystical tradition so much. Um, and so the idea of not just having a spiritual vision, let's say, but actually elevating your consciousness, as we say, or, or, or transforming your consciousness to, to become more, to be freer, to be, to be less bound by our multiplicities, less bound by our passions, all that stuff that is in the mystical tradition. I think that that's the key for Sam. That's the, that's the discussion that is going to help him break, uh, break his, the way that he sees some of, some of this stuff. Like what I would like to have, like if I had a discussion with Sam Harris, I would just say, okay, look, I know you don't like religion. I'm religious. That's fine. Let's not talk about that because it's going to be a dead end. Let's talk about consciousness. Let's talk about that and let's lay it out. Okay. What does a world in which consciousness is central, how does it lay itself out? How does attention lay itself out? Right. It lays itself out in terms of hierarchies, in terms of hierarchies. You have a point of attention and then around that point lay the world kind of flows out into chaos, which is on the edge, even in your visual uh, frame. That's how it works, right? So you have points of attention, and then on the edges, you have this chaotic space, which is, which is kind of gray and, and, and not totally there. And so you say, okay, so now let's take that experience of consciousness, and let's say that that's the foundation of reality. That's what he says. He says that's the foundation of reality. Well, is there an analog to that in a community? What does that look like? What does, a commu what does the analog of consciousness in a community look like? Right? It looks like it looks like gathering together around a point. Looks like turning around a point. It, it's it's circumambulation. It's a it's a it's it's a hierarchy of social of, of structure, uh, and it ends up looking like a religious ritual. That's what it looks like, right? Because that's that's r religious rituals are have the same structure as the structure of consciousness. So I think that that's and then how does what does that look like in time? 
what does the experience of consciousness look like if you see it with the frame of time? And what it looks like is a story. It's the same. And so I think that that's, that would be the work that I think could kind of help Sam Harris move a little bit further down, down the road. I don't know. He's, he's actually also, his whole world is, his whole career, his, everything about him is caught up in his, in his position. And so it, I don't know. I don't know if you'd be willing to make that move. I thought the debates themselves were very frustrating. Um, in, I thought they were useful in the sense that I thought that Jordan had a chance to say what he wanted to say. And I think that people in the audience, people are going to be listening to it. Some of them are going to be willing to make the work, to do the work. Some of the, some of the schemes that he laid out, like the scheme of human sacrifice, I thought was like, if you're, if you're honest and, you, and you're honestly attentive to what he's saying, you will see how strong what he's laying out is and how evolutionary correct like in terms of just evolutionary thinking, how correct what he's laying out is. Um, and so I think that some of the viewers will probably be willing to make the work. I, I don't know. Uh, but for Sam, I think consciousness, I don't know. I, I think he was going to do a, um, an interview with Don Hoffman. I don't know if he did it, but uh, I think that someone like Don Hoffman could help Sam kind of move forward. Like Don Hoffman, I don't know if you know about, about him. Did you follow that? No, I don't. I, so I, Don I, just, I just want to, what, what yeah, it ahead. sounds like you're talking about is the, is the phenomenology of consciousness. Yeah. You're sort of basically saying, this is the way that you get, you, you try and argue with Sam Harris with the phenomenology of consciousness. What does it look like? Because that's what he says, that's what he says is the basis of reality. And mm. the thing is that the phenomenology of consciousness doesn't actually transfer easily into scientific thinking. It's actually scientific thinking is actually quite far from phenomenological consciousness. Phenomenological consciousness actually looks way more like a very primitive vision of the world where there's up, there's down, you know, uh, and your whole experience is there to tell you when you're up and down because when your head is upside down, you don't feel right, you know, you don't, you don't feel right. And so the, the, your whole body and your whole experience is there to experience heaven and earth and is there to experience uh, um, time and is there to experience also limited attention and then a hierarchy of attention. Uh, and, and that's how we set up our communities. Everything's set up that way. So I would kind of move through that with him to, uh, to get him to understand what these stories are about. Um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's kind of, that's what we're trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. Like my brother, Mathieu, uh, he wrote a book on uh, cosmic symbolism and Genesis. And that's exactly what he's trying to do. He's trying to bring it back to consciousness and show you how the structures in, in, uh, in Genesis, the stories are basically, that's what they're talking about. And in the story in Genesis, the creation story, it's obvious that that's what it's talking about, at least in part. I mean, you have the use of word. You have this notion of, of uh, opening your eyes and then being self-aware and, uh, and then actually covering yourself to protect yourself from the outer world. It's like the whole story of the fall, it's obviously talking about consciousness. It even, that's what it is. It, it's, a, some, it's a being who, who acquires a certain type of consciousness and then the effects of that consciousness on that being. Uh, I don't see how you can't see it. It's obvious that that's what it's about uh, anyways. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think you also spoke to that. It's, it's, it's very hard once someone has established a position, written a lot of books on a certain perspective to, to go through an experience of, of, of having to change their minds. I think that's, that's, a, that's a big part of it. Um, yeah, I think so. As well. But I think I think that it it's not it's not I don't think it's not impossible. In a way, Sam Sam is also someone who is who is honest. Uh, sure. He has these pat he has these weird patterns that he falls into, uh, you know. And it's like Jordan Jordan was talking about. I mean, he he laid out this amazing discussion about this this notion of of a mimetic process by which we identify the ideal man. Uh, the ideal human and then we project this ideal human and we represent him in the dome of a church in the heaven right of of your experience and then we look up together towards that mimetic representation and then we we see it as the model by which we live our lives and then sam harris is like yeah but what about fundament fundamentalists and it's like that's all he could say was what about fundamentalists what about it's like you're not this discussion is not moving forward it's mm -hmm. not and you could do this with anything you could do that with anything and i love when jordan said do it. Take the Buddhist stories. Do it. Do it with the Hindu stories. Please, Sam, do it. If you say that you can do it with anything, do it. Maybe it'll give you some insight into, into how these stories work and how this stuff works. And it's not, 
that it's not all arbitrary and, it, and it's not just a bunch of stories we tell each other. You, you can't escape, even if you enter into an evolutionary way of thinking, you can't escape it. Everything you do has to be within that. So our stories have to be part of it. Our con concepts have to be part of it. Everything has to be part of it. You can't just discount an aspect of humanity as if it doesn't matter because that means you're not trying to understand what it means, what it is to be human. You can't just say it's silly. Well, you have to be able, it's there. You have to be able to talk about it because that's also part of, of the, the uh, let's say the, uh, the emergent phenomena, like you have to be able to talk about it. Yeah, and it also speaks to that paradox that, that Peterson points out about you can either be an evolutionary thinker or you can be an atheist. He doesn't see how those two things fit together. Yeah. Or at least you have to admit that religion has some, something this long lasting and powerful must have some evolutionary benefit. Yeah, and also um, the, the, the idea that, for example, that we want to discount irrationality, that we want to be rational, it's like, okay, well, then you're not taking into account the fact that we're irrational. I mean, we are obviously irrational too. Like, it's, it's obvious that we are. And so there, there are reasons, there are purposes for our irrationality. It's not like irrationality contains the entire scope of human experience. So if you want to say that, that you can only filter the world through rationality, then you're, you're definitely creating something which is going to be lopsided. And, and what I think and what Jordan thinks is that it's going to create a totalitarian result because you're, you're unaware, like you're totally unaware of, uh, of what, of what the, 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 that other aspect of ourselves is. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a very strange. Uh... Trying to turn the light on, which, ah, there we go. <laughs> I've around the room to get the light back on while I've done it. Um, yeah, this is something I, I've heard, I think, in, the, in those debates, Sam calling what, what Jordan believes dangerous quite a few times. I, maybe I haven't heard enough of it. Did, did, does Jordan describe what Harris believes is dangerous as well? Or is it kind of a one-sided discussion on that, on that front? I think that, I think that it's interesting because I think Jordan... I think Jordan, okay, so Sam's retort to, to uh, Jordan is that, you know, all the, the horrors of the 20th century and, and the, let's say the late 19th and early 20th century, those were still religious, still religious uh, thinking that were continuing, you know, and, and I think that that's where Jordan kind of, he, he, once in a while, he'll give like a, like a thing, okay, talk about Mao and Stalin, and then Sam's retort is, no, that's still religion. Uh, and I think that Jordan hasn't totally figured out a way to, to kind of move past that without starting to argue. And I, he doesn't, I don't think he wants, he wants to argue. Um, but I, I think that, that Sam, because Sam, it was so funny the way he dealt with that in that discussion where Jordan brought that up. And Sam said, I'm going to deal with this because I'm sick of hearing this argument. Like I'm sick of hearing it and I'm going to deal with it once and for all. Then he said something like it's, he said what you would expect. No, that's still religion. But it's like, I'm not convinced my buddy. I'm not convinced at all because it was already there in the French Revolution. You know, all that was already there in the French Revolution on a smaller scale, but we're, they're talking, we're, now we're talking about tens of thousands and maybe up to a few hundred thousand people that were slaughtered because of reason. Like they, they, they clearly said that the, that, the, that the motivating factor behind their action was reason, science, progress. That's exactly what they said. And they even had the cult of reason where they, they destroyed all the, the church, they would empty out the churches and they used the church building to celebrate reason. And so they would all get together and celebrate reason. And, uh, and, uh, and that, that happened in the blood of the peasants, like that happened soaking in, in, uh, in Catholic blood. So uh, I, think that, I, think that, I think that that's kind of, a, it's, it's a frustrating thing. And I think that's, I also actually also think that's what makes Sam's position dangerous is because he thinks that he is innocent. He thinks that he's innocent and that his position is only innocent he always says something like, atheism just means the belief in no God. There is no positive aspect to, to atheism. Now we want to propose, after that, let's leave that aside, now we want to propose some positive things. Uh, and he's in the position where he can say, well, what I propose has never been tried. It doesn't exist. And so, ah, oh, it's so beautiful. Look at how beautiful what I'm proposing is. And he doesn't, he can't, he can't understand the, the side effects of what he's proposing. He can't understand how when you do something, you cannot, you don't necessarily know the ramifications on the side. Uh, and so he, he complains, let's say, about, about uh, North American nihilism and their obsession with their cars and with celebrities. Uh, 
but then he 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 somehow sees that as negative. But then he wants a secular society. It's like, well, maybe a secular society gives that because that's what happened. And the other alternative to that, to like the kind of mall going uh, fat, you know, uh, diabetes, like <laughs> maybe the the only opposite to that is to anchor yourself in something like reason or nation or something lower on the the hierarchy, and then becoming a yeah, becoming an ideologue and and then just going and destroying churches or, you know, killing whatever group that is going to be killed because he's not part of your thing. So anyways, I, I like I said, I've said this in the discussion before. I don't think Sam Harris is the one who would go out and, and burn churches. Obviously not. It would be more like the Varg type, you know, like Varg would, he would take the atheism to go in and destroy churches. It wouldn't be Sam, but in the wake of what he's proposing, that's what, those are, that's what's going to happen. I, 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 I can't see anything besides that. 